Sure, Ben, and thank you for being with us today. Uh, mm -hmm. We are joined here today for a practice example interview for the Support Center for Data Sharing. And in these next roughly 30 minutes, we will discuss your work at LifeBit and to discuss what it has to do with data sharing. Um, and I'm sure you know this, but to everyone who's listening or watching, uh, we are joined here by uh, LifeBit, a company that has created patented technology enabling researchers to run analyses on multiple distributed data sets in situ and avoid risky uh, risky transfer of highly sensitive data um, as they believe that biomedical data that can be used to save lives should be used. Now I will be interviewing you today as part of the European Commission Support Center for Data Sharing. This initiative is uh, set up by the European Commission uh, to further support the development of the digital single market. Our objective is to facilitate data sharing, that is, transactions in which data held by public or private sector are made available to other organizations, also either public or private. Um, and the aim is uh, that data can be reused then um, and, and used for initial purpose. Uh, we do so in a number of ways. So we research, we document and report about the data sharing practices, EU legal frameworks, but also access and distribution technology. Practices that we select are not only relevant to organizations, but they often also imply novel models or overcome legal or technological challenges in some sort of innovative way. We regularly interview data sharing practitioners like yourselves for this initiative, um, and we capture these interviews in our collection of practice examples. Our talk will be a part of this collection too, uh, and I'd like to talk today uh, about the solution that you've built and your views on data sharing, uh, and specifically in the health domain. But before we get into this, would you like to maybe introduce yourself? Well, thank you very much, and uh, it's great to be here. My name is Torben Seger. I'm the Chief Business Development Officer for LifeBit. I'm calling in today from our headquarters here in London, uh, and I look after our global commercial strategy as well as our partnerships with governments, with pharma companies, um, and you know to get get our product out and get us closer to our mission. Nice. Could you tell us a bit more about uh, the company and the and the tool or tools that you provide? Absolutely. We're a software company with headquarters in the UK, but offices around the world. And we work with big data custodians to make their data securely available for research. So these can be governments, national precision medicine initiatives, universities, biobanks, healthcare providers. So people with lots of very valuable but sensitive data. And on the other side, we work with leading pharmaceutical companies um, such as Beringer Ingelheim, the world's largest privately held company, in securely accessing this data to use it for research. And are your customers then, uh, well, globally based? Is it Europe focused? Um, okay. No, in, the, in our world, this is a very international world because uh, we might be speaking about it later. Diversity in this kind of data plays a huge role. So we work with data custodians on three continents. Uh, you know, our pharmaceutical companies are um, between the US and Europe at the moment. Um, but even that is set, set to change. So it, it is a very global business, the data of science, the, the business of, uh, sorry, uh, I'll take uh, the... Um, it is, it is a very global business, um, you know, the business of data, the business of research. Um, so our clients are all over the world. You can imagine. Um, and um, why would anybody uh, contribute to your solution? So what's in it for them? Is it is it monetized? Um, could you tell us a bit more about that? Well, when we look at our data custodian government, uh, data custodian clients such as Genomics England, that's uh, an entity that is owned by the Department of Health here in the UK. It was set up in, back in 2012 by the then Prime Minister David Cameron, whose son regrettedly died of a rare disease. And it was set up to create a large cohort of patient data, 80,000 rare disease patients, 20,000 cancer patients, their whole genome sequenced which was a moonshot project at the time, um, and the medical data um, uh, within a da database to be made available for researchers. And clients like this, clients um, you know, like the Danish National Genome Center, which is the precision medicine program of the Danish government, um, and other clients around the world are creating these data sets to 
create a research asset to provide researchers with the kind of data that helps them discover new biomarkers. You know, why some people, for example, contract COVID uh, more severe than others. You know, what are the underlying genetic variances to understand diseases better, uh, to develop better drugs, better treatment, and ultimately bring precision medicine to life. The problem is that this data is extraordinarily sensitive and therefore solutions are needed to make it um, analyzable in situ, so without moving that data. And that's the kind of software we provide. So it's much more that we get them closer to their mission, that their data is being used as often as possible, because our mission is to make sure that all data that can help lives, save lives um, and develop new therapeutics should be used. And uh, those government examples are front and center of institutions that want to see that data use, but of course they need to safeguard it. So in a way, uh, you're building a data ecosystem, right? With the software in a way, because there's in, in in a way, correct, because the world exists of tons of these Im beautiful initiatives, but often they are siloed, right? Because the data, even if you de-identify it, is so incredibly sensitive that moving it out of the control of the data custodian, you know, it's not it's not permittable under GDPR. It's a, and uh, it, the same holds true in Asia, in the Middle East, in in Africa, in Canada, really anywhere outside of the U.S. Uh, this very much holds true, and even there it's changing now and that means if you want to use the joint value of data across those silos you need innovative technology and it basically creates an ecosystem you're right and, and this this connectivity is is incredibly important there are some studies that that show when you increase your patient sample set for such analyses by 10x so you go from 3000 patient to 30000 patients you can in some cases have a hundred times the scientific findings the genomic associations found in there and you know so it's almost a uh, well, this is an exponential relationship in some cases and uh, another perspective to look at this you know, a human has 3.3 billion letters in their DNA and millions of genes and every one mutation of which people have, again, millions, uh, can be relevant, a relevant driver for disease. But to get statistical power, you need enough patients. And, you know, when you look at cancer, which comes in many different forms and you can stratify it and stratify it um, with inclusion and exclusion criteria, every cancer becomes a rare disease. And while rare diseases have it in its name already. It's hard to find enough data, and therefore collaboration, collaboration through tech, uh, connectivity is absolutely essential. Yeah, so the researchers are the prime uh, uh, uptakers uh, of your technology, right? So they use it to uh, uh, do their studies, but is there also, um, is your tool also useful for, for doctors uh, uh, in a real life uh, immediate situation? Uh, absolutely, precision medicine um, spans both research and clinical application. And with our technology called LifeBit Precise, we are also able to bring clinical decision support straight to those clinicians who first recruited the patients in the hospital. So really doing the end-to-end -end journey from uh, patient consent, uh, uh, patient consent administration from sample collection, the production of the data, um, that it becomes analysis ready, making it available to researchers, as discussed previously, but then also back to those clinicians who first recruited the patient to then help them find a more accurate diagnosis uh, and, and better treatment plans is an absolute essential part. And that really integrates the technology then deeper into the healthcare system. And um, are there, this may be a bit of a critical question, um, but uh, it sounds like a very useful tool that everybody would want to have. Um, are there any people that dislike the software that you provide and why? <laughs> that tends to be competitors because we've been disrupting the world um, uh, vastly. You know, previously it was a very centralized approach where you would have SaaS platforms, software as a service, who own their own environment. These are for-profit private companies that create their own environments, and then they would ask a researcher, would ask an institution to send the data to them to then 
provide analysis over that. And that is an antiquated model. When you look at the uh, demands of regulators, when you look at the uh, compliance frameworks and uh, every concept of data security and data privacy, and uh, we have turned this on its head, um, which you know, breaks things and uh, requires sometimes new governance structures to be set up. But ultimately, we firmly believe that if you leave data where it is and analyze it in situ, the vast majority of compliance challenges are solved. But, you know, as with all new things, sometimes you need to change minds. But most certainly, those are the people who dislike it. And patients themselves, I mean, their data is recorded. Um, um, do they know? Do they care about it? Is there uh, is that transparent? Or do they have any ownership of the data that is collected on them? A hundred percent. First of all, the patient always owns the data that never changes. And all of our clients, uh, be that the, the British government, be that the Danish government, be that large universities like Cambridge University, have consent given for the research over this data. So when the patients either as part of standard of care on a specific recruitment for these research projects were asked to provide their samples, they were also informed about what's going to happen and what is not going to happen. And they provide a broad research consent over this data so that the so-called secondary use um, for research over this data is possible, but obviously not for every commercial entity in the world, uh, like an insurance company or a, a weapons manufacturer, of course not. The people accessing the data are bona fide research organizations, both public, like universities, as well as private, like the drug makers, who are a critical part of the uh, uh, journey of actually bringing research insight all the way to bedside in the form of a new therapeutic. And as a matter of fact, uh, when you talk to participants, uh, you, you can see that they're actually very excited about this, you know, especially those from disease cohorts, you know, um, who, who are unfortunate to have cancer or, or a rare disease or one of their uh, loved ones has. They are very interested in tangible research performed over this and um, an acceleration of uh, this data leading to insights, leading then to novel therapeutics. Um, but at the same time, you know, they want to make sure that their data is in fact secure. So in a nutshell, it is the government, government organizations or the big biobanks, the big healthcare providers that source the, not just the samples of the patient and their medical data, but also the consent for that, uh, that research. So they very much know what is happening and they retain their ownership over that data. Yeah, and I think it makes it easier if you know that you're doing it for a good cause, right? Absolutely. Uh, so I myself, I'm part of the UK government's COVID study um, you know, where they recruited 35,000 patients um, of, who had COVID, 20,000 who had an unfortunate path and had to go to an intensive care unit, um, and 15,000 sort of mild controls like myself, um, other than uh, health secretary, we are part of this court, you know, we had a few bad weeks um, in, in bed but you know, didn't have to go to the hospital. And our samples were taken, our clinical data was provided and whole genome sequencing was performed over that. So you know, very much you are interested in uh, furthering the understanding that humankind has of diseases and develop new therapeutics. And this data is such an important driver in this. And you know, especially when your circumstances uh, get more dire and you you know you, you you get sick with cancer or a rare disease um, you, you would you want solutions you want to understand it better and we can see this broadly where patients are kept in the loop you know, and that's very important. The public trust is absolutely essential for that, right? The communication is absolutely essential for that. You can really see a big enthusiasm around that. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, like you, you mentioned that there's a couple of competitors out there um, uh, from your own. Um, do you uh, envision uh, one big um, sort of data space, data ecosystem um, where uh, biomedical health data can be shared, or uh, should we have multiple initiatives um, to drive competition still and to drive innovation? Um, what are your views on that? First of all, a differentiation is important. On the one side, you have data custodians, the actual entities that generate the data, right? And these will be forever siloed. There will be not the one organization to rule Europe or the world or anything, because 
the university in one country is very different to the government in another country and 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 where we come in as the unifying element as as technology providers they can bridge these silos and interconnect these silos but even in, within that we might have a head start here because we've been developing federated technologies uh, for for a long time in, with a lot of uh, a lot of uh, financial backing by some of the world's largest investors so we have might have a head start but at one point you need to connect these silos even if these silos themselves are not run by lifebed and that's possible and as one example here in the UK with funding by Health Data Research UK and UKRI, uh, the, a consortium of Genomics England, the UK government, University of Cambridge and LifeBit supported by a bunch of other institutions like the Eastern HSN um, have, have won a government grant to develop the communication layer between two of what we call trusted research environments. So you have the data and genomics England here in London, and you have the data in, in University of Cambridge. And uh, these are wonderful big cohorts of very valuable but sensitive data. And what this grant did was to work on the uh, communication layer between these two so that researchers can query I want all women over 35 with breast cancer and a BRCA1 mutation across these, maybe finding X thousand here is and a few hundred there, and then run joint analysis over that using the, lo the local compute. I'm getting a bit detailed here, but the important thing is that that communication layer that we've developed is in fact an open source API standard, you know, compliant with GA4GH uh, guidelines. GA4GH is the Global Alliance for Genomics and Healthcare that is set to set those kind of standards. I believe we're one of the few projects that has already implemented GA4GH passports. So that's the way to make sure that the authentication can happen in various different silos, right? You still need to have computing power and uh, modern technology in the silo to make things happen, right? Uh, and w we're doing this with more and more and more governments around the world. But it is absolutely important to say that at one point, more entities, even though not those partner with life, but need to be able to connect with one another. And we are pushing that ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Good to hear. Um, maybe mindful of time. Um, one last question. Um, what are you, what are your ambitions with LifeBit and how do you see uh, the future of data sharing now that we have more and more ecosystems uh, popping up? Um, and as you said, maybe initiatives like yourself, uh, like yourselves will keep, uh, uh, will guide certain silos. Um, but the data custodians will always uh, still be there to, to keep it relatively in place. Um, how do you see the future uh, in that? Where, where are we headed to? Luckily, we have reasons to believe that uh, with a slew of new announcement that will come uh, in, in the next uh, weeks and months of new big governments uh, um, partnering up with us that we really can connect an ever increasing uh, data volume around around the world and make it easy yet secure accessible for researchers because in a, in a nutshell we, we just want that more data is used more often by more people more easily while keeping it secure right and that it uh, truly becomes a reusable asset a rapidly usable asset so to accelerate all of precision medicine. And uh, for that, we are bringing together uh, different countries diff from different continents um, to increase, increase the diversity of that so that the, the cohorts don't just look like me, which currently is still very much the fact, right? Like white male or white, uh, white Europeans is a majority of these cohorts and we need to drive diversity um, bringing data and co patient cohorts from different places of the world and you know if i can say one thing a bit cheekily we fundamentally don't believe in the concept of data sharing it should always be data collaboration and accessing data in situ because data sharing implies that you send it around like it's confetti and uh, i think it's a bit uh, it's 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 too sensitive for that um but it's just a semantic a semantic thing i think we are we are absolutely on the same page here. Uh, so we do believe uh, that Europe is the place that innovates this, and I will include the UK in that. You know, yeah. Brexit or no Brexit, um, you know, we are still compliant with GDPR here, and with uh, being a world leader in genomics, uh, that that is the UK. 
within such a framework and then having the institutions like the NHS, um, you know, as a role model for much of the world to copy, we are hoping to work ever more closely with European governments and European biobanks, uh, like we do now with the Danish National Genome Center, to truly interconnect more and more and more of European countries with the UK globally, with one another. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, we, we do believe that we're going in an era of connected data. And if I can add one more thing, because we talked a lot of these data custodians now, we're now seeing um, a, a new approach also from global pharmaceutical companies who have started to understand that the world is in silos and that internal data aggregation, i.e. paying maybe for money, uh, licensing data or paying for the creation of data and then taking it in-house into the pharmaceutical company, that that time is over and will not return, not in Europe anyway, and who have now understood, okay, these silos exist so we just need to overcome the silos and we need to interconnect them. And that's one example where with Beringer Engelheim out of Europe, out of Germany, uh, we're creating a global data network. Uh, it's called Dataland, uh, where Beringer's Engelheim internal data, of which they have many, much, becomes interconnectable with that of the UK, with that of some Nordic countries, with that of some Asian countries to create a global cohort and a joint view of data, be that external or internal, so that more more data becomes available to researchers while keeping it in situ, while complying with the local governance. And it's very exciting because this is accelerating the, the, the world's journey into a connected era. We want to work horizontal, right? Not vertical is, uh, I think, a nice way Absolutely. Uh, to, uh, to remember that. Yeah. Uh, well, more data, more diversity. Um, I like it. I think that's a, that's a nice way to end it. Um, is there anything else from your side that you would like to add? That I would like to add? Well, I think I, I, I try to ram a lot in, into that, but um, for us as, as a software company um, here in the UK, we play a big role in helping to inform certain regulations or discussions. And, you know, I believe we can provide a lot of insight. Um, you know, we work with the OECD uh, quite closely on, on uh, data sharing or collaborative platforms. Uh, we work with the WHO and then and, and, and informing m many of these things. And we would love to provide that uh, also more directly to the European Union and, um, and uh, countries on the, on the continent. It's strange that you're now uh, this island um, uh, that doesn't belong to the the union officially anymore, but I think in spirit still. So, uh, well, uh, amongst researchers, amongst the field, it still very much feels as one. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Thurban, for being with us today. Uh, I really enjoyed our talk, uh, and we learned a lot about um, silo data and data collaboration, as you call it. Um, uh, I would like to thank you, um, and uh, please to our audience, uh, you. This practice ever in your website. Be in touch. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Have a great start into the week.